Hello and welcome to the Global Health Matters podcast. I'm your host, Gary Aslanian. In this episode, we will be discussing snake bite. This topic was suggested by one of our podcast fans and a partner organization, Fio Cruz, Osvaldo Cruz Foundation in Brazil. I must admit, I was a bit worried about how we can tackle this complex and at times not well-known public health issue. But after three very engaging discussions with my guests, all doubt and trepidation have disappeared as to the importance and relevance of snakebite as a critical global health issue. The WHO estimates that 5.4 million people are bitten by snakes every year and nearly 140,000 people die. In this episode, we will be discussing the realities of snake bite at community level, as well as the complexities associated with producing and administering anti-venom. I'm joined by Diogo Martins, the research lead for snake bite at Wilcom in United Kingdom. Later in this episode, you will also hear from two other guests from Brazil and Eswatini. Hi, Diogo. Thanks for joining me today. Really looking forward to speaking to you about this topic. So what struck me most in doing this episode is that very few of us who work in global health would consider snakebite as a pertinent global health issue. Why do you think is that? Hi, Gary. Uh, good to see you. And uh, let me start by saying you have an incredible microphone. I'm very, very jealous. So it's really nice to give that microphone and the podcast the, sort of the stage to snakebite. And uh, I couldn't agree more uh, with you. You know, snakebite oftentimes doesn't find the right place anywhere. It is a global health issue in my perspective because it's an issue that transcends boundaries of countries. So it really transcends, you know, just a disease that happens in an underserved location in country A or B. It really brings together so many of those problems um, in a way that, you know, a person suffering from snake but having had an issue or an episode in their families of snake bite in country A, they were probably going to be replicated somewhere else. And sometimes those problems are addressed by solutions that also transcend those national boundaries. So for that reason, in my perspective, when the problem is global, when the solutions are global, to me, that's a global health issue beyond countries, beyond just one community. It, it, it's an issue that brings in different communities and snake bite is that but you know we have so many different global health priorities sometimes it's really hard to climb the ladder of priorities in global health mm. because you know resources are still limited so for that reason you think it deserves attention the burden is quite big and we do know that in snake bite you know about five million people are bitten every year not all of those bites are venomous bites more or less two to 2.5 are venomous bites and we do know that out of those two million bites uh, venomous ones a lot of people will die. We're talking about 100,000 deaths every year, and this is most likely an underestimation. And four times more of that will live for the rest of their lives with, you know, unfortunately, amputations, PTSD. And that's a huge burden. And uh, we've done a little bit of desk research about how that compares with many, many other popular global health issues. And it's actually quite a, a substantial amount of years live with disability and uh, it's, it's quite expressive but people mm -hmm. just do not know much about it because it feels a little bit remote to many of us right. unfortunately and venomous means poisonous just to be clear well um, for simplicity we could say so um if you're talking with an animal expert or a wildlife expert they'll probably say it's not exactly the same okay it's, it's about the way the particular venom uh, or poison it's injected so for example Snakes are venomous because they have a mechanism to inject you with the venom. For example, if you look at the different species, some of the frogs are poisonous because just by you know touching the surface, the skin, the, the modus of, of getting those toxins into your system are quite different. But you know, for simplicity, let's not overcomplicate because it's already so complex. Right. We don't want to alienate anyone. Yeah. So for this episode, I uh, was able to speak to some champions to are working to address this neglected issue of snake bite. One of them was uh, Dr. Fan Hui Wen. She's a scientist and a program director at the Institute of Butantan in Brazil. 
So this institute is one of the oldest public health funded research institutions in Brazil and uh, actually quite big producer of antivenom, both in Brazil and South America. I also spoke with Thea Lichka Cohen. Uh, she's from Esvatini. She is the founder of the Esvatini Antivenom Foundation. She's a real forerunner in the community in the prevention and management of snake bite. So maybe, Diogo, we can start by listening to their stories of how they became involved in this issue. Let's start with Dr. Fan. Well, my story starts when I was a child and my family used to come to the Instituto Butanta, especially when relatives come from Taiwan, my homeland, in fact. And when they came to visit us, it was a special day at Butanta. It's an exalted place and it's such amazing with a, a very extensive green area surrounded by historical buildings and full of educational activities on science and animal conservation. And then when I finished my uh, degree in medicine, I had the dream to work in remote areas dealing with vulnerable communities treating tropical disease and helping people live in the Brazilian Amazonian forest. But at that time, I realized that I didn't know anything about snake bite and venom. It's one of the health problems in tropical countries. So for over more than, for over 30 years, I had been dedicating my career. And more recently, I decided to work in the industrial manufacturing complex of antivenoms because of the commitment of providing good quality products and also to help to increase the availability and accessibility of antivenoms for all that need them. And let's also hear from Thea next. It happened by chance, actually. My son, um, at the tender age of seven, had a project, um, his very first project at school, and they had to pull a topic out of a hat, and he happened to pull uh, the topic snakes. Whilst helping him, I came across a website for a company called African Reptiles and Venom, and when I started to research, I saw that they do uh, snake handling courses. I went and I did the snake handling course, uh, a week or so later, I received a photograph of me holding this massive mamba uh, with a petrified look on my face um, in a frame, which I just plonked on my desk. And within a couple of days, the phone started to ring and the, the word had spread that I was catching snakes. And the phone would ring and they said, please, can you help me? I've got a snake in my house. And that's how it all started. Hmm. Diogo, I understand you know both Dr. Fan and Thea. What do you think we could learn from experiences that they've just shared with us and their passion? Well, Gary, let, let me start by saying, you know, Dr. Fan and Thea are both incredible, incredible individuals. I learned a lot from them and uh, I've learned a lot about snake bite from them. And it's been really a pleasure over the years to, to keep doing so and, and try as much as we can support the work that they do. And it's, it's so interesting because both of them have, you know, similarities in their stories, but also the fact that, you know, the contexts are different within the, you know, the continents where they come from. What I really liked about the stories is sort of the family links, right? It's, it kind of feels like it all started, you know, years ago and unexpectedly. Many of us working in global health, everything is so planned, you know, you go to university, you know, very early on, you do your training medical training and suddenly you know that you want to become an infectious disease doctor or a psychiatrist. And it's funny because to me, what, what, what I take from these stories is, is pretty much the same, the, 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 the role of chance. You know, I, I'm from Portugal, I'm a medical doctor by training and I did not learn in, in medical school how to treat a snake bite, right? So that in itself, the role of chance and how that connects with our personal stories, either with family, but also you know, professionally, the, the sort of unexpected encounters and opportunities, then you suddenly just start reading a little bit more and you become fascinated. So I started working in Snake Bite five years ago 
and I was working climate change before, uh, climate change and health, which couldn't be more of a macro uh, type of global health issue. And focusing in, in snakebite, uh, due to the virtue of my personal, professional, and, and sort of other stories that let, let, led me to the space and the kinds of people like Thea and Dr. Fan, those were inspirations that sort of end up keeping you engaged with it for uh, for a very very long time. I particularly chime with uh, Dr. Fan's story mm -hmm. when she was thinking in med school, you know, she wanted to go to the Amazon uh, area to work with underserved populations. I also have that, but probably I thought 10 years ago that I was going to be doing it in a completely different way. So I, I really like how, you know, one the role of chance but the but the role of chance and you know these, these happy accidents end up putting the right people in the right place in the right time and i think that's the case for dr fan and for sure uh the case of there right right and the experience that they had that then kind of cemented that passion uh for them to continue doing what they do so in doing some research, we realized that availability and accessibility, acceptance of antivenom is still a major challenge, as you said, worldwide. Brazil is one of the few countries with an established national program where antivenom is free, but even then they have a lot of challenges. And both Dr. Fan and Thea shared some experiences about the situation in their respective countries and settings. Maybe we can hear from them. In 1986, the Minister of Health established a program, a national program for snake bite control. And at that time, and since then, we have four public antivenom manufacturing laboratories. And we are responsible to supply the national demands of around 500,000 vials to treat nearly 30,000 patients a year. So the Ministry of Health centralized all acquisition of vials produced by these four laboratories since 1986, being responsible for providing antivenom for states and municipality in a decentralized uh, policy. And this is what allowed all the universal and free of charge treatment for the whole population antivenom treatment should be given by a physician. That means that many rural sites are deprived from this kind of uh, health professional and consequently from the antivenom treatment also. So this is one of the big challenges for a country as large as Brazil and also for other parts in the world to give access to antivenom. As we know that time is crucial for the outcome of snake by the venom. Our reality nowadays is that the patient may take several hours or even days to reach a healthcare unit. We may need to have the antivenom vials, but it's not enough to solve the problem of snake by the venom. We also need to know uh, how to administer and have uh, health professionals to be aware of all knowledge in summary, my opinion is that having good distribution of antivenom and well-trained health professionals, essential components for a success of a problem for a snake bite and venom control, it's a challenge that we have to face. Thea builds on what Dr. Fan shared and highlights the situation with antivenom on the African continent. In addition a lot of the clinicians have no faith in antivenom. And it's something that we have taken many years to overcome. And it's simply because of the ineffectiveness of the antivenoms that are currently um, on the market. Um, there's no regulation with regards to the effectiveness of the antivenom. To produce antivenom is not difficult. To go through uh, the the preclinical trials, it is incredibly costly. I had no idea how difficult and costly and, and cumbersome it was to actually produce this product. If it does happen, it needs to be very well regulated. It needs to go through the processes. It needs to be monitored. Otherwise, we're going to go back uh, 10 years and we're going to be in a situation again where the doctors say, what's the point of using antivenom? It doesn't work. 
So, yes, countries can start producing their own antivenom. They should start producing their own antivenom. But with that comes a lot of responsibility and ethics and planning. We have to plan this very well. But I think as uh, the African continent, I do think we have the uh, ability to produce our own. So just like you said in the beginning, very different settings, but a lot of challenges when it comes to this, Diogo. Uh, what do you think is needed to overcome these challenges? And do you know if there are any innovations, new options that are on the horizon and might be coming soon and be available? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Sort of, you know, how can we overcome this? I always, when I reflect about this and talk to colleagues about this, and I've spoken to Dr. Fan, for example, many times about this, we're always quite conscious that we're not here as new partners and trying to reinvent the wheel or completely ignore the fact that, you know, a lot of these things have been discussed for decades. Mm. And even the, the current way treatments are produced is based on a technology that is over 100 years old. Mm. We come into the space with a lot of humility, with an open eyes, open ears. Over the past few years, I've been looking into the therapies in more detail. There are promising things that happened over the past five years to make sure that, for example, the treatments that have been produced in the same way using forces are then produced in a way that improves their safety profile, improves their efficacy profile. We can actually do clinical trials uh, with those. We know that, for example, within Sub-Saharan Africa, there's only been about five different clinical trials for uh, antivenoms. Mm -hmm. And we know that at the moment, there are at least 18 different antivenoms in the market. So it's as you know, Taya said, it's uh, severely underregulated. A lot of these technologies were introduced in markets before any regulation even existed, right? So there's a lot of things to do in terms of the traditional antivenoms, but also in terms of the new technologies. So things that might be a little bit more advanced, talking about, for example, small molecules that might be repurposed, you know, have been produced to, for one particular disease area that might be used for a snake bite. We can repurpose them depending on the th different types of syndromes. Or we might be talking about uh, recombinant monoclonal antibodies that do not need necessarily an animal to be produced. They are a little bit more similar copies to human um, antibodies. So there's a lot of progress and, you know, how far those things are, as you were asking, Gary, yeah. from, you know, being a reality. Yeah. It's still a little bit far away. You know, hmm. we're talking about five, 10 years, if not more. Clinical trials take time, for example, if you're looking at conventional antivenoms. But th there are promising hints that the field is moving in, in that direction. One thing that I'm particularly excited about, and I'm happy to talk about it, Gary, mm -hmm. if that's of interest, mm -hmm. is the other part of the delivery. So not necessarily the science, but then, you know, we have these shiny, improved technologies. How do we make them accessible, right? The WHO, with its own strategy, has talked a lot about finding ways to expedite delivery, to make sure that countries can look for the right interventions for them and access them at a cost or at a price. I'm really excited about this because it really tells us that the importance of having an end-to-end -end approach, really good science, really good delivery, but most importantly, Gary, in my perspective, and this might not sound new, especially with COVID being so fresh in our minds, it's all about coordination. We don't need only prevention. We don't only need treatments. We don't only need community engagement. We need a coordination of all of this and I think a laser focus in making sure that that really happens but uh, some of the innovations I would say just to summarize are a little bit more short term right. but maybe some of the new technologies might take a little bit longer. And do you really think that some of those innovations have like access in them by design already thought through? Are they thinking about that as they think of the innovations? I think it's inconceivable to be working global health these days and not really think about these things really seriously, not really thinking about, for example, if there is a contract in the future with a public or private manufacturer, right, right. you know, are they thinking about IP? Are they thinking about access? Are they thinking about, you know, focusing on low and middle income or more resource limited settings in the first instance? Are we talking about pricing strategies that are going to be sustainable in the long term? 
for the manufacturers, but most importantly for the populations. So I think so, and I think the majority of partners who are in this space are really looking at this very, very, very seriously. Snake by Gary, as, as you probably know, in terms of the, the market failures, does suffer from other issues that, for example, other disease areas do not suffer in terms of scale. You know, you market, don't really have market, economies yeah, of scale. Yeah. Precisely. So it's, it's, in my perspective, it's about finding ways to keep the supply and demand on board. But obviously, front and center are the patients. You know, it's inconceivable that you can continue in five, 10 years time having patients having to pay $100 in many geographies to solve one episode of a snake bite. Hmm. Again, we cannot have individuals that earn a dollar and a half a day and have the unfortunate circumstance of crossing paths with a venomous snake and suddenly all of their savings are gone to not even mention other other impacts socially and economically. Snake bite is not only a significant healthcare issue but also has socioeconomic and psychological repercussions for communities. Taya highlighted the lived experience of this very well. Let's listen to her. I really appreciate this question that you're asking. It is an aspect that is very seldom considered when it comes to snake bite. Uh, the, the focus is usually on the snake has bitten. We need to treat the patient. Um, that is challenging enough as it is here in Africa. But we very seldom look at the consequences it has on the family and on the livelihoods of the people that have been affected. Um, I see this time and time again, um, and two cases come to mind when you ask this question. The first is an old man who used to be an Induna in his area. That means he was a leader or a chief, and um, he was sleeping and he got bitten by a Mozambique spitting cobra, and uh, he unfortunately lost his leg. I got to know this old man in the hospital. Um, He was there for many, many weeks. I built this relationship with him, and he went from a proud subsistence farmer who used to to help his community to somebody who couldn't walk, couldn't um, fend for himself, uh, couldn't grow his own food, and he died a lonely and broken, broken man, Uh, all because of snake bites. So in the face of this uh, shortage of antivenom and in the context of many barriers to its administration, Taya developed a very effective community-based response strategy. So let's hear from her a bit more, Diogo, and maybe you could reflect on that after. I've been involved with snake bite and snake bite conservation for almost 20 years. And um, I was a very slow learner, I must admit. I would do a lot of education and I would stand there and I would preach and I would um, um, discuss snakes and the importance of snakes. This went on for many years until one day the light came on and I thought to myself, I'm out there doing all this work and I I spent hours and weekends and weeks out in, in the communities talking to people and talking to people and I just get these blank looks most of the time. And then I thought to myself, why don't we train uh, volunteers from these rural areas, from these communities, so that they can take ownership of the problem themselves and that they can themselves assist their own communities. And I trained 52 um, community rescue volunteers, and we had them here for a week. We did a lot of training, uh, practical training, theoretical training. We gave them the PPE a mobile phone and data on their phone, and we said, all right, let's give this a bash. And they went out into the community and so proud, so incredibly proud. And um, we started to immediately see a change in the response to these community guys who are out there. They're living in those rural areas with no electricity and no telephones and no roads. They understand the problem so much better than what I do, even though I thought I did and I'd spent so much time in the field working. And all of a sudden, there was a change and the message was received with so much positivity. They believed the message and they slowly but surely started to change the perceptions in these rural communities. They go to schools, they go to cultural activities, they go to road shows and they just speak about the importance of conservation. They take snakes with, that's very, very important, and the people get to hold the non-venomous snakes. We teach people when you see a venomous snake, how do you react? 
we talk about how you prevent the snakes from coming to your home. It's been so effective. Besides the conservation message that's going out there, it's the correct first aid. What do you do if a snake bites you? What do you do to try and preserve life and limb? Remarkably, over the last three years, we've managed to reduce the snake bite incidence by 27%. This simple project, now we've got closer to 100 of the community volunteers out there. But this simple approach has been life-changing, absolutely life-changing. That's such a great story, and I can really hear Thea's emotion as she's explaining how it all started, and the particular, you know, sad story about the, unfortunately, the, the gentleman in the community who did not survive, how some of those very difficult stories then are the start of something really special and important. The part that I really like the most, and, and my biggest takeaway is, is really the when you really start a particular project, especially in the communities, and really, you know, well-intentioned, you're putting the hours, you're really trying your best, you know, to do something that is useful for the community. But then you realize many times your contribution there might not be where your contribution is best located. And being able and having your eyes and ears open and really listen and observe how sometimes you, you're probably not the right person to be in front and, and, and to lead a particular community project. And we do know from other countries as well, the model where you have uh, members from the community being part of the solution mm. generates in itself positive outcomes when it comes to generating jobs, giving them purpose. And sometimes with the most simple of things, a phone, mobile data, and magic happens. So I think... To me, it's kind of the start of this whole project with a story of the, unfortunately, the gentleman who did not survive and leading on to something that is quite robust, 50 volunteers and then up to 100, right. and then being able to bring down incidents by almost 30%. So you can even argue within snake by community engagement is ever more important because, again, it doesn't matter how shiny your intervention is, how well thought through your policy framework will be. If the folk who are supposed to be benefiting from this are not aware, do not understand what's going on, do not understand their role, do not know what they need to do, you know, it's it's all work that will not do what it's supposed to do. This story to me is quite special and also like hearing that Thea's emotion on the positive way and how proud she is mm. of, of this project is very humbling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was uh, actually one of those uh, moments when I was talking to her, I said, I'd like to see that actually one day. Yeah. But it was really interesting to observe that particular achievement that they've made there. Diogo, as we draw to the end, maybe we can explore a few more strategies by which an issue like this can be addressed. So one of them was mentioned by Dr. Fan in the value of South-South collaboration and uh, partnerships between countries. Maybe we can hear what she had to say about that. In Latin America, many anti-venom manufacturing laboratories are public institutions, and some established more than a hundred years ago as Butantanes. Of course, as one of the oldest uh, manufacturing laboratories, Butantan has a responsibility as and a commitment to solve health issues and to work with other partners in, in this way. Uh, recently, in 2018, we established a network among the 13 uh, public anti venom manufacturing laboratories in Latin America. Because, in fact, we know each other for a long time, and we feel that we need to work uh, in partnership not only partnership, but in a network. So the Pan-American Health Organization through the Panaftosa Center agreed to coordinate this network. It was, uh, 2018 was the year where the WHO established uh, the, the, the goals or the, the plan to reduce uh, snake bite and venom in disabilities and mortality. So it was the opportunity to, to join all uh, players 
in this initiative. And, and we start sharing experiences, organizing seminars, trainings, preparing guidelines, and also developing or preparing preclinical, epidemiological, and clinical studies to be performed. Some of them strongly supported by uh, Wellcome Trust, the charity agency in the UK that is very uh, committed to this plan, to this big plan uh, to reduce the burden of snake bites in the world. So I would say that solidarity is the hallmark of the public and even laboratories in our region. Yeah. It's part of our uh, our job for decades or even more than a century. We, are, we, we think that not only providing anti-venom is a possibility, but also the model of how we have been working for these years in our region is also a, a, a way that each country in other region can achieve or can develop their own learning curves in, in terms of how to control and prevent snake bite and venom, considering their local and cultural aspects. Diogo, in your work at Welcome, do you work on supporting and facilitating this kind of cross-country learning and sharing, and how does it look like? When we took on the challenge of looking at snake bites, mm -hmm. We're looking at not only supporting really good science, good research, but also looking at all the factors around it that will make it successful, all the enabling factors. We talk about policy, we talk about regulation, we talk about networks, we talk about working with countries. And there are a few examples that Dr. Fang was just talking now in, in her contribution about a network in Latin America, for example, where the public manufacturers, which respond directly to, in the most part, to the ministries of health in terms of forecasting, in terms of the needs, in terms of distribution models, um, you know, that network has been around for a few years before COVID. They came together during COVID even stronger. So we do some work on supporting that, enabling network activity, which is all about the countries being on the driving seat, telling what the priorities are, making really clear what the resources would be that would make a difference, and also making sure, and we try as much as possible, try to fertilize those ideas and try to bring that message and that learning to other countries, both within the region, but also, for example, Brazil works a lot with the African continent, which is quite exciting, right? And also Asia works a lot with the African continent and, and so on and so forth. And from that perspective, try to spill over the positive effects of that collaboration and that process of building good science. Dr. Fran shed really good light on the, on the incredible work, I have to say, gold standard work that it's taking place in the Latin American context. Right. And you mentioned there are some other similar initiatives in, let's say, in Africa. Where are they now in that process? It's a good question. So, for example, as we look at the different regions, it's, it's very clear to me that, for example, Latin America has huge experience with manufacturing of antivenoms in a model that is mostly based on public laboratories that are somehow connected to the ministers of health. You know, Vital Brazil, Sao Paulo, Rio, all of them. The history of coming up with antivenoms, the conventional ones as we know them, really started in so many aspects in that continent. Mm. If you go to, for example, Africa, we have, unfortunately, only one regional manufacturer of snake antivenom in South Africa that only produces antivenom for the continent. And as we do know, having tremendous issues with that supply alone. So we don't have a similar network. Right. But what's happening, what's being created recently is in particular countries where there has been historical support for snake bite research, for example, that's the case in Nigeria, in Ghana, in Kenya, some networks being created into a platform that focuses a little bit less on the manufacturing, but building a research agenda for public health, which is a lot more on the implementation side. So how do you create the evidence, epidemiological evidence, that gets you really good data 
for how big the problem is mm. and how much of a solution uh, is required. So those sorts of networks are accelerating a lot within the African continent, both implementation research, but also clinical trials. If you go to Asia, for example, the ASEAN uh, network and a lot of the countries in Southeast Asia working very closely on health economics. They have tremendous health economists at universities in Thailand, in Malaysia, mm -hmm. and many other countries as well, including countries that unfortunately are going through difficult times, political instability, still being very, uh, very active on this, looking at epidemiological data, linking with WHO regional offices, trying to bring more of the you know, economic element, understanding the impact, tremendous amount of literature being published in the last few years on this in mm. particular. So I do see a future where, you know, in different parts, different continents contributing with different fields of expertise and models of collaboration. But I expect hopefully in the next five to 10 years to see even more of that and a little bit of a different snapshot of, of what Snakebite looks like. Mm. Well, that's very hopeful and promising. I'm sure when we look into this in five years, the picture will be different. Some of the challenges we unpacked today were very unique, and I'm hoping our listeners have learned a lot through this discussion. So thanks so much, Diogo, for joining me today and having this discussion, and best of luck with your future endeavors. Thank you, Gary. Obrigado. A ciao. Snakebite is a complex and neglected issue that requires a multifactorial strategy, including conservation, community engagement, scientific research, and robust healthcare delivery. As highlighted by my guests, antivenom is a scarce commodity in most settings. One way to address this issue is through strong cross-country and regional partnerships and networks. Hello, I'm Claudia Chamas, a researcher at the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation. I'm thrilled to share a remarkable podcast that I wholeheartedly recommend to both health professionals and the general public. Global Health Matters. Under the guidance of Dr. Gary Azlanian, the podcast brings together experts from diverse countries and backgrounds to explore an array of compelling topics. These discussions span crucial subjects such as access to diagnostics, climate change's impact on health, the empowerment of women in science, health diplomacy, and an extensive range of other pressing issues. I invite everyone to listen to the third season. This initiative offers a unique opportunity to broaden our knowledge and engage in meaningful conversations about global health. Thank you, Claudia Shamas, for your message. Thank you for being a fan of the podcast. To learn more about the topic discussed in this episode, visit the episode webpage where you'll find additional readings, show notes, and translations. Don't forget to be in touch via social media, email, or by sharing a voice message with your reflections on this episode. Global Health Matters is produced by TDR, a research program based at the World Health Organization. Gary Aslanian is the host and the executive producer. Lindy Van Nieker, Maki Kitamura, and Obadiah George are content and technical producers. The podcast editing, dissemination, web, and social media designs are made possible through the work of Chris Coase, Elisabeth Adessi, Isabella Suda Dayao, and Chembe Collaborative. The goal of Global Health Matters is to produce a forum for sharing perspectives on key issues affecting global health. Send us your comments and suggestions by email or voice message to tdrpod at who.int and be sure to download and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening.